And we are live. Hello, welcome everyone to Read Z Live, uh, our ongoing series of webinars where I bring on professionals from the world of publishing to show you how to write and publish better books. Today, uh, we have a bit of a November special, uh, a returning guest, Caroline Levitt, the novelist and New York Times bestseller, who will be talking to you about the beginnings and endings of novels. Uh, after all, uh, when you finished reading a book, you probably best remember the first bits and the last bits, don't you? So she's going to be talking about that and share some parts of her approach uh, to crafting uh, beginnings and endings, which I imagine have a lot to do with each other. Uh, anyway, while we wait uh, to start, for everyone to filter in, uh, do say hello, tell me where you're from. Uh, city, state, country. Uh, let's see who we have. I hate from Sweden, from Kimberley. Uh, Caroline from Denmark, so already Scandinavia, very well represented. Terry from Kentucky. Uh, Paul says hi from uh, North Carolina, US. Hand in hand together. Hello from Scotland. Shane Huxtable from Kansas. Wonderful. Jeff from Minneapolis. Thank you all for joining. If uh, you've been to some of these before, you'll know how this works. Uh, I'll bring on a guest. We're gonna, she's going to give a bit of a presentation. And then there will be a Q&A at the end. Uh, I can, I'll be sort of watching and uh, answering any questions on the comments that you put down. Most weeks I have to operate uh, a PowerPoint presentation, but... Uh, Caroline likes to speak directly to uh, the crowd at home, so uh, I can actually pay attention to the comments for once. Um, great. Uh, Robert from Staunton MA checking in case they need an alibi. Wonderful. Uh, Brad from Ontario, Canada. Uh, Eucalyptus books from Clearwater, Florida. Great. Well, we're going to start in just a few minutes. Uh, I might as well get a bit of housekeeping out of the way. Uh, if, you, if you're watching this later, uh, then yeah. You, you will know already that the replay can be found at this very link uh, at any time. In the next few days, we'll also have a transcript made, so if you prefer to read through things, uh, then that will be available on the ReadZ homepage. Uh, there's a link to that in the description. Uh, yeah, and that's pretty much the big things there. Uh, yeah, we'll just wait a couple more minutes and let's see who else is here. Uh, Lawrence from Wokingham, uh, Sheila from County Down, Northern Ireland. Uh, with Tigwell from Yeovil. Fantastic. Let's look a little bit further up. Lisa from Jacksonville. Hello, Lisa. Ad Adri from Barcelona. Uh, Greta from France. Really nice international crowd. I know it's uh, November. Is anyone taking part in NaNoWriMo this year? Uh, if, if you're not in the know, that's a, a sort of a contest. It's a nominal contest because there's no pride apart from there's no prize apart from pride. Um, where folks try to write 50,000 words of a novel in... November. Uh, yeah, I I'm sort of taking part in it um, for the first time. Zone380k said, uh, did I start that mustache uh, this morning? I did not. I've been growing this for over a week. Um, what's it? This is the first time I've tried to grow a mustache and uh, some will agree that uh, it's probably not so successful so far, but we'll see how this goes. Tune in in December to see uh, the end of that particular project. Uh, we have Agnes from Sardinia. Uh, we have No Shave November going strong in the villages. Uh, we have CPAC from the mid coast of Maine. And Duf from Nigeria. Fantastic. So many folks from everywhere. Debbie from Stoke. Welcome. Welcome, welcome, welcome. Uh, I know we haven't started yet, uh, but I'm going to put a plea out there. Uh, if you've enjoyed any of these in the past or you're looking forward to this, give this video a thumbs up, a like, uh, and maybe consider subscribing to our channel where we put out fresh content every week. Uh, all right. It is now 8 o'clock where I am here in London, which means it's 3 p.m. on the East Coast, midday on the West Coast. Uh, I think like 3 in Hong Kong and maybe five, uh, maybe 7 in Sydney. I don't know, the daylight savings has really messed this up for me. But let's get started. Okay, let me introduce my guest for today. Uh, she's a longtime Reads the Editor and a returning live stream champion. She's the New York Times best-selling author of Picture of You, Cruel Beautiful World, and With or Without You. Her 13th novel, Days of Wonder, is due to drop in April 2024. Uh, please welcome Caroline Levitt. Caroline, how are you doing? Hi, I'm absolutely fine. Thank you so much, Martin. And thank all of you for being here. I'm, I love doing these and sharing all the stuff that I know, what works for me, and I, hopefully it'll work for you too. Wonderful. Like, uh, it's, it's great to see such an international crowd. Uh, you Are you still in New York, Caroline? Yes, I am. I'm right outside New York City, the publishing center, and this is my writing office on the top floor of our house. And you know, welcome to my writing office too. It's it's nice. Like uh, 
You have multiple you. writing areas. You've got a desk. I guess you have a couch. Do you sometimes find yourself... Couch to nap. <laughs> yeah. All right. Sometimes that's all you can do is just sit on the couch and nap. And uh, is that a ukulele or a guitar at the back? That is a ukulele given to me by my son when he went to Hawaii. I can play it a little bit and just badly. And that is a puppet that my son used um, to work, to practice for his role in Avenue Q a few years ago. So, uh. you know, I just keep it there because I like it. Was he on Broadway or was he touring? Oh, no, 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 no. This was, this was a high school production. Oh, high school unof production. unofficial. Well, I guess you have to like Unofficial. It. Oh, it's sort of. Official for us. Official yeah. for us. Uh, great. Well, uh, I know you, there's a lot uh, for you to get through. Maybe we'll give it just a scooch longer. We have, I think, 630 people, yet only six, only 90 thumbs up. Uh, wow. Like That's so great. Uh, but yeah, we've done a few of these before uh, with yourself and Gina for a few of them. Uh, right. I think for that one, you were talking about the publishing process and the sort of. Right. I think right. we were talking about right. middles in one of them as well. Middles, yep, yep. The, the soggy middle, people call it. And so I guess it only makes sense for you to uh, round out the rest of it and do beginnings and ends. Yep, yep. Oh, I have to shout out to Jennifer Plummer, who said she loved my book with you and with, with and without you. Thank you so much, Jennifer. Um, like all authors, I love hearing that. <laughs> the more I hear it, the better. So thank you for saying that. Have you had, um, have you had any good uh, sightings of your book in the wild? Yeah, you know, I, I, every once in a while I see it, but what's more amazing is when I'm just sitting someplace in a park or reading and somebody will come up to me and say, are you Caroline Lovett? And I'm always so startled that they know who I am. Are you worried <laughs> that, that you're about to get served? Somebody. Yeah, it's, <laughs> it's great. Yeah, I'm happy to be served. It's just, it's just been incredible. But yeah, I do see books of mine around and that's always wonderful. It's always wonderful. Wonderful. Well, it is now a few minutes past the hour, so I'll let you get started, Caroline. Uh, okay, great. Thing, I'll just be uh, off stage left, uh, and we'll thank see you so much for the Q and A. Have fun. Thank you, Martin. Okay, so hi everybody. So you know, your beginning and your ending really can make a good novel great. You know, whenever I'm browsing at a bookstore trying to decide what book to purchase, I always do first things. First, I read the first page, sometimes just the first sentence, and then I read the last page. It doesn't really spoil anything for me, but it does give me an idea of the change that's going to take place in the novel. So I'm sure all of you know the feeling of opening a book and being engrossed right up to the last page. But how do you as a writer make sure that this feeling is there? A large part of this alchemy is knowing how to craft a good first chapter and a last chapter. I always look at it as if your first chapter is posing the question of the book and the last chapter is answering it. So how do you do that? Well, I'm going to show you everything that I do everything that I know, everything that has worked for me, and I hope it'll work for you guys too. So let's tackle the first chapter first. In fact, let's go to the very first page. And in fact, let's go to the very first sentence. The reason why your first sentence is so important is that actually when you send in a manuscript to a busy agent or an editor, they don't have a lot of time. You can be Proust or Hemingway or Elizabeth Stroud on page three, but the agent or editor may not know it. You have to make them want to continue to read after your first sentence. Your first sentence has to do that. So I want to look at, I actually want to look at my last novel, With or Without You. The first sentence took me six months to figure out. It can take a long time. And it's a very simple sentence. The sentence of that book is just, they were arguing again. So it's short, but I always thought, well, that's packed with meaning. There's an action there. There's an argument. And if you're a reader, I'm hoping that you're going to want to know, what are they arguing about? How nasty is the argument? Why is that pesky word again there? Which means trouble has been there for a long time. The first chapter introduces the characters. That's the most important thing. All plot comes out of character, not the other way around. 
So we have a former rocker, desperate for a next chance, his longtime girlfriend, a nurse, who wants him to settle down. See, it's getting very conflicty. The relationship is at a crossroads until she caves and drinks and does drugs with him and winds up in a coma. End of first chapter, right on that note. Instantly, I think, or at least I hope we all think, what happened? What's going to happen? Will she get out of the coma? Is he going to stay with her? Are they going to break up? And that leads to the question that I wanted my book to ask, which is what happens when you're in a long-term relationship and the other person changes? The ending of the book has the answer and the explanation for it. And the one thing at the end that the nurse had wanted and hadn't thought she wanted is hers at the end. So we get the beginning that asks the question and the end which answers it. Think of The Handmaid's Tale by Margaret Atwood. The first sentence is, we slept in the gymnasium. The next few sentences give us a sense that these are all youngish women and they're all imprisoned and it's against their will. That instantly is going to capture us and make us want to read more. If you turn to the end of the book, the last sentences are about this imprisoned young woman going into a truck. But we don't know. Is she going there to be rescued or further imprisoned? To confound us further, Atwood also has an epilogue at the very end of the book. It's a century ahead of this whole, whole novel, and it's important because one of the questions this novel is asking is, what happens if our world turns upside down and everything we thought was right is wrong and vice versa? Will the world stay that way and why? And Margaret, Margaret Atwood ends that part of the novel with, are there any questions? And it leaves it open for the reader. So how and where do you start your first chapter? This is something I see a lot on Rizzi with, um, mostly with new writers. Don't start with a description. In the 18th and 19th century, it was really popular for people like Dickens to describe a house for five pages, to describe a village for 20 pages. You don't want to do that. You want to have a character in your very first <coughs> sentence. For example, say you start with a sentence like, the house was big and blue with white shutters. It sort of sits there, right? We have no idea of the character, no sense of the action, no sense of emotion. Why should we care that the house is white with blue shutters? So how do you get around that? Easy, easy, easy character. You put a character into the writing. So you could rewrite that sentence like this. Darlene was always terrified every time she saw the white house with blue shutters. See, now we have a character. Now we have emotion. Now we know there's a conflict. She's afraid of this white house. And this leads to questions we're going to read on to find out. Why is she afraid? What, what is she going to do to conquer that fear? Does she even have to go into this house? Don't start with a long explanation either. The Handmaid's Tale puts you right in the middle of the conflict. It's like a you are there scenario. You're, where this you're right with this character, June, in this gymnasium. You've lost everything in your life. You don't know what's going to happen. All the reader knows is what June knows. We have her character looking and seeing the other women and wondering about them. And we know her goal. Something happened to the world. We don't know what it is yet, but we know that June is desperate to escape. We don't know her plan yet to escape, but we do get the sense on the first page that it's life and death for her. And it's, that's always interesting. And we're going to continue to read to find out pacing. You want to get to character and plot fairly fast. If you take six pages to tell us about a book a character is reading or what they're eating for lunch and how it tastes, your readers are going to start looking for another book to read. Very important. Remember, a story is not this happened, then that happened, then that happened. A story is really because this happened, this next thing 
had to happen. Knowing cause and effect will keep your pages moving. You might want to think like a screenwriter. Consider that a silent screenwriter. Consider thinking of what your first chapter is going to look like if it was only action, where nobody's explaining anything to you. We're just seeing characters do actions. So here's a trick to make sure it's just actions. Look for all the adjectives and adverbs. I know we've all been taught, or at least I was in second grade, Printify your writing, use images, use adjectives. That's actually not great advice because adjectives tell us, they don't show us. So look at it, look at an example. Billy was skinny. Okay, it describes Billy, but what if the person who's describing him is a liar? We can't see Billy, so we don't know what Billy looks like for herself. So how could you write that without using the adjective skinny? Um, how about this? No one could fit through the space except for Billy, who had only to turn his body to the side to easily slide through. Now, I cheated a little and I used an adverb easily, but you see the difference? If you want to try something like this for yourself, I always tell writers, try to write a paragraph about two people in love, but don't use the word love. Don't use the word romance fondness, kiss, anything like that. Just see how you can show it with actions. Remember, actions speak louder than words. Actions are more truthful than words. Look at this sentence. Angel loved his wife madly. Okay, so he tells us this. Do we believe him? What if you wrote this? Angel came into the house. His wife was on a on a chair. I love you so much, she said. I love you madly. And then he strode towards her and he slapped her so hard she fell from the chair. So we feel that and we know that if Angel loves his wife, that's not the kind of love we like. So we know by the actions. A lot of times you'll hear people talking about how the first chapter sets the tone or the mood. What that means is when you're reading a book and looking at a book, you, or at least I always want to know instantly, is this a funny book? Is the, Are there jokes in it? Am I laughing yet? Is it dark? Is it serious? Is it both? Um, don't listen to people who tell you you can't change your tone from chapter to chapter. You absolutely can. But think what kind of book you want to write, and that will sort of dictate to you what should be there. So what should be in your first chapter? Most important, your first chapter actually should give us the question your book is asking, which is usually a question that's haunting you and the reason why you wrote the book. Uh, in my book, Days in Wonder, I was wondering about what does it really mean to be innocent and what does it mean to be guilty? Uh, because that's a really murky area. And I feel that I answered that in that book. So what was obsessing you? What did you want an answer about? And what did you discover at the end of the book? If we take The Great Gatsby, one of my favorite books, Fitzgerald's question was deeply personal. It was, are the rich different from me and you? And if they are, why? That's a question that was plaguing him all his life because he was poor and then he became rich. And he always felt that the rich belonged to a special club that he wanted to join. And somehow he could never feel like he belonged. His book explores that. In the very first chapter, we see that question. We're introduced right away to Nick Carraway, guy like Fitzgerald, born poor, yearning to be rich, who tells us what he wants right away, to be invited into Gatsby's inner circle. And he's got a plan to get there. This first chapter also shows us something important, which I call the misconception. This is why the character hasn't been able to achieve what he wants before. It's like, if you believe that being rich will bring you happiness, you might become rich and you're not happy. And then why not? You have to figure it out. The, en the ending will tell you 
that you can become rich, but it won't be satisfying for you, which is what happens with Nick. See how well the ending and the beginning are connected? The beginning asks, the ending answers. The beginning asks, if I'm rich, will I be happy? And the ending answers, you can be rich, but you're not going to be happy. So want another example? Let's take an alcoholic. An alcoholic is sure if he gets into a relationship, he'll stop drinking. We know that on page one. But of course, this is a misconception because his character doesn't know, but we, the reader, sort of figure out that if something goes wrong with any relationship, this guy's going to want to drink again. And he does. Your first chapter should also hint at a wound, or you can call it a character ghost from the past that your character hasn't healed yet. And maybe he doesn't even want to heal it. For example, let's take, let's take our alcoholic again. The alcoholic's ghost is that once, years ago, he got so drunk, he drove drunk, and his wife and his kids were in the car and they died and it was his fault. So this guy's haunted by guilt. But when he thinks about it, it makes him want to drink more instead of less. That's something he's going to have to change. Your first chapter should give us hints of a plan or at least a recognition that staying still or doing nothing is impossible. This need to act is called the inciting incident. It's the one thing that shows your character into action. In The Handmaid's Tale, June is in the gym being screamed at by another woman and told that she has no bank account, she has no kid, she has no husband. She knows she's got to escape. She has to move. If she stays still, things are going to get much worse. So where to start? Start in the middle of the action or start right at the point where the instigating action is going to come. You can also call that the disruption because it disrupts your character's life and forces him to go on a new journey. My upcoming novel, Days of Wonder, begins with a 22-year-old woman released from prison, walking into a media store because she's media storm because she's still she's still a felon. That's all you know at first, but you know that once she's out of prison, she's got to act, she's got to do something. Her life is going to be different, and that rises up all these questions. How is it going to be different? What is she going to do? You don't even know why she was in prison, but you're going to keep reading to find out. It feels like she has a plan because she's looking for her mom, but we don't know yet what it is. Okay. Use, don't tell everything all at once. Use action on a need to know basis throughout your book from the first chapter to the last. That keeps readers reading. Let me give you an example. Here's a perfectly great sentence. Billy ran, terrified that his father would catch him. Good sentence. We know there's action. This kid, kid or guy, kid's running. He's afraid of his father. Okay, here's a better sentence. Billy ran terrified. Okay, that's even better because now we don't know who is he running for? What's, what's the fear? We're going to read on to find out. Um, it ramps up our curiosity. And here's the best sentence. He ran. We have no idea what that is. Is he running in a marathon? Is he happy? Is he terrified? The next few sentences might give you that answer. Lauren Groff, who is a wonderful prize winning author, has a wonderful new novel called The Vaster Wilds. It starts out with a young girl running in the forest in ragged clothes. We have no idea why. All we know is she's running. The interesting thing about this novel is Groff gives us only information as we get from point to point as this young girl is remembering her past. We don't get the whole story. Why is she running? Who's after her? Is she going to survive? What happened? How she can escape? To the very end in the very last chapter. I want to talk a little bit about point of view. That should come first. And the point of view is who is telling the story. Readers want to know that. You can tell the story in first person. I went to prison. Second person, you went to prison. 
all ranges of third person. Evelyn went to prison. You can switch point of view in the chapters and have more than one protagonist. You really can, and they can all have equal weight. One of my friends, Jonathan Evison, wrote a book called Small World, which had something like 40 protagonists in it, and it got great reviews. It was a rave review book. So figure out who you want to tell the story, and usually it should be the person who's going to change the most. Okay. Avoid prologues. A prologue is usually a short, almost poetical piece that provides background information about a story or a character. Do you need it? The answer is actually, well, maybe. I've seen beautiful programs, like, for example, one that shows a nameless person murdering somebody else. And then chapter one starts in a sunny suburban scene, switching tone actually, where a woman's feeding her kids and she hears on the news that there's a murder around. That connects the two chapters and sets up two moves. But bear in mind, this is a practical reason not to use prologues. For some reason, at least in America, agents and editors have decided that they hate prologues. They feel it's too much information. It's too explanatory. So I always tell writers I work with, if you must have a prologue, call it chapter one. You know, nobody's going to say, hey, wait, that's not chapter one. That's a prologue. Just call it chapter one and you'll be safe. Think of your first chapter as an invitation. To recap, first chapter introduces your character in trouble, tells us the stakes, Stakes will rise, tells us the question the novel is asking. So let's go to the last chapter. Your last chapter is actually as tough to write as your first chapter. Um, believe me, I know, it takes me forever. Your last chapter answers the question you posed in your first chapter. It, in the last chapter, your character should be totally different than what they were in the first chapter. I always make a diagram if it starts out this cat chapter starts out shy. By the end of the book, she's bold. Starts out alcoholic, end of the book, sober, or at least trying to get sober. You want to see a difference. You want to see character change. So how did this journey change a character? Ask yourself, what did the character learn? Are they in a better place? or a worse one. The best stories don't have any everything all neatly tied up in at the end, unless it's a specific genre like romances do that. Usually at the end, there's a cost to getting whatever it is the character got. Nick Carraway and Gatsby did change. He went from poor and dying to be rich to rich, but not wanting to be rich at all. The cost for that as if he realizes that the rich are different from the rest of us. And that's a sad thing for him to realize. The rich, he now believes, have no soul. So he walks away from that. And interestingly enough, Nick walked away from being rich, but that's something that the author Fitzgerald never could do himself. The story world or your setting also should be different at the end of the book. Because where we live changes as we live. If you think about it, maybe you grew up in a tiny town and you hated that town. You felt suffocated. All you want to do is you want to go to New York City. So you go to New York City and at first you love it and you're happy there. And then as you get older, you begin to think, you know, I don't really like paying $5 million a month for a tiny apartment, which is New York real estate. It's, it's I'm starting to get tired of the crowds and um, there's not enough business opportunities. You go for a visit back to that same tiny town you hated, the same tiny town you vowed you'd never go back to again because you hated it so much. And to your surprise, all of a sudden you like the very quiet you used to hate. You like the people who used to bother you, and you find that now there's business opportunities. The, this, the world, that tiny town, didn't really change, but you, the character, did. And that's what's great for us to see before the end of a novel. How do you really end the novel? This is what I call the cut before the kiss, how to end at the right spot. 
you know when you go to see movies or you watch a TV series and there's two characters, they're sort of flirting and then they fall in love and you keep watching it because you want them to. You want them to fall in love. You want them to kiss. Excuse me. But in many things when they do kiss, it's disappointing because then you close the book and what are you imagining after that? Where do you go? It's much stronger to cut before the kiss. So then readers close the book and they wonder what's going to happen. If you think about the Margaret Atwood book, the very last sentence of that book is hundreds of years after this terrible society of Gilead is gone and somebody is studying that society and she's saying and she's telling how that society died out but they don't really know how and her last question is any questions so first of all Handmaid's Tale started with this new world was just beginning and it's a nightmare the end of the book itself was where we don't know what's going to happen with this society. We just see June trying to escape. The epilogue ends with, we know this society turned around. It's no longer there. But by having the last sentence like, any questions? We have lots of questions. We're going to close that book and wonder, oh my God, how did a society like that come about? Could it come about here? What am I going to do about it if it does come about? It leads it wide open. There's a term for endings, which was coined by the story structure guru, John Truby, called the new equilibrium. That means that sometimes you can end your story just by showing your character acting in some new way. Um, Great Gatsby, Nick Carraway doesn't have to tell us anything. He doesn't have to act anyway. All he has to do is walk out of Gatsby's mansion and walk back towards where he came. The alcoholic, the former drunk, we can know that he's no longer an alcoholic. If he walks into a bar, uh, the bartender slides him over a whiskey, he shakes his head, he points to club soda, he drinks the club soda. We know by his actions, he's different. Do not, at the end, a few caveats, don't explain to us why a character is the way he was. Don't just show it. Don't philosophize. Do not have a cliffhanger hanger at the end unless it's part of a series. And even then, like the Harry Potter books, for example, they have to stand on their own. Um, also, when you're done, when you're done with your whole book, you can also think of looking at it from back to front. If you're stuck, think about your last chapter and try to backtrack. If it ends with somebody in prison, think about how did that start? How did that originate? What would be the good opening for a book that started like that? It's a way of double checking your novel too, that all the beats make sense. Most important of all, I have to say it again, a story is not this happened, then that happened. A story is because this happened, the next thing had to happen. Start reading differently. Of course you read for pure, pure pleasure, but when you finish a book you love, go back to the first chapter. Look at the first sentence. Look at the first page. Go to the last chapter. Look at the last sentence. Ask yourself, how does the first sentence capture your attention? Does the first page show you the protagonist? After reading the last chapter, do you know what question the novel is asking? Did it answer it? Did it leave you wiggle room so when you close the book, you're still going to be interested in this book and thinking about it? Another great thing to do is watch movies because the structure jumps at, out at you much more clearly. Think about which movies grabbed you instantly. What did their openings tell you? Were you bored by the, uh, by the opening? Was there enough action in it or did you love it? Which ones didn't? Which endings were satisfied? And which ones made you angry? I want to end this because I have four helpful books for you <clears throat> that you might want to look up. The first one is called Wired for Story by Lisa Cron, C-R-O-N. Lisa talks about how we're all absolutely genetically wired to love stories. It's a biological thing. So we can, if we experience 
terror seeing certain details will be more careful in real life. Her book is very good. The first five pages by Noah Lukeman. Noah Lukeman is a really wonderful agent, and he tells he talks about what should be in those first five pages. Refuse to be done by Matt Bell. This is all about the revision process, and Matt talks about what should go into a novel first, what should come second, how to go about doing it. And finally, The Anatomy of Story by John Truby. Now, John Truby marks everything up, and he goes into great, great detail. The only caveat I have about the John Truby book is that John Truby is actually a screenwriter and the book is mainly for screenwriters. Take from the book what resonates for you and the rest you don't have to. And that goes to my closing statement, which is that there are many story gurus out there. It's really not all one size fits all. Certain things will work for you. Certain things you'll try and you'll say, this is nuts. This is just nuts. I don't like this. I'm not trying it. That's all fine. By dint of being here, you're all writers. And I know you can learn a whole lot, hopefully from this, and also hopefully from continuing to read, continuing to write, continuing to try things out and see why they haven't. So I'm going to open this up for questions now. Brilliant. Thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much. (laughs) You heard it. uh, Send your questions in uh, and we'll get through as many of them as we can. Um, There's a lot of people, I guess, as always, when you talk about first scenes, there's always going to be more discussion on prologues asking like, well, what if this is right? I know, I know, I know. (laughs) We've got a question here from Roseanne saying, is it okay for the inciting incident to occur in the second chapter? I imagine there are books where it happens much later than that. Yeah, yeah, it is. As long as we know that you're the character who's going to have that inciting incident, as long as you know that there's problems coming up. Let's say that your book is about, um, say it's apocalyptic and, and all of a sudden, um, the whole world is going to go dark. Um, you don't have to have the world go dark until chapter two. But in chapter one, you want to show that there's an unease. Maybe the air smells differently and nobody knows why. And your main character is saying, oh, it's nothing. Stop, you know, getting all bent out of shape. We still have to know in the exciting end. We still have to know in the first chapter that something is about to change. But yeah, it can be in the second chapter or the third chapter. Uh, The other major rule I always have is there are no rules. If it works and people are still interested in your chapter, um, then you can move that inciting incident further on. Uh, We have uh, another question here. Well, here's a procedural one. Who's the author of Refuse to be Done? Uh, Matt Bell. M-A-T-T B-E-L-L. Matt Bell is also on Instagram and he gives great advice on Instagram a lot of time. He's he's actually solved some of my writing problems on uh, Instagram and on, on Twitter, or I guess it's called X now. He's also on there too, but the book is great. It's very reassuring. Uh, great. We have a question here. Um, Dragos, could a good story where the character does not change uh, from the beginning and a plot is carried by the struggle, but not the end result? Yes, I'm so glad you asked that, because I forgot to talk about it. One of my favorite books, which actually, believe it or not, is an equally good movie, is Leaving Las Vegas. The main character is this guy who is an alcoholic who did indeed kill his wife and child in an auto accident. He decided there was nothing for him to do, but because it was his fault to drink himself to death. That's what he wants to do. He does not change through the whole novel or through the whole movie. He's consistently wants to drink himself to death. But because you have to have movement in a novel and you really don't want to stick with somebody who doesn't want to change, you have a subplot. In Leaving Las Vegas, the subplot is this guy hires a prostitute to help him drink himself to sleep, to to death. And she says, fine, I don't care. I'll do that. It's money. It's, It's an easy job. And she starts doing it. And then she starts to change because she starts to feel for him. She starts to fall in love with this guy. And in the end, about seven of the eighth of the way through, she's She's got this choice, this moral choice, which is damned if she does, damned if she doesn't. She really helps him kill himself, then 
she's going to go to prison, first of all. And second of all, she's losing the one person she's ever loved. If she doesn't help him to kill himself, there's still a cost because he's going to be so furious with her. He's going to leave her. So she still leaves the only person she's ever loved. And, you know, he's going to die anyway. And the end of the book is, is it's just wonderful. And he still does not change, but she does. And that's what makes his suffering so interesting and what makes her story even more interesting thank you so much for asking that question uh okay let's uh pull out another one here uh some people were talking about um stories that span a series so talking about though does this sort of uh does this sort of equate to that the idea that there needs to be a change there needs to be a question and answer within each book of a series yeah, I mean, I'm not, I'm not the best person to talk about series because I don't really, I, I, the only series I ever wrote were, were kids series, Wishbone, about a, a little dog. And the thing is, you cannot count on people reading series in order. You cannot count on them saying, oh, I love book one, I'm going to read book two. They might read book three and say, oh, I really like this, I'm going back to book one. So that's why you don't want to end with a, a cliffhanger. You have to assume that every book is going to stand on its own. And you have to assume that every book is still going to start with a problem, a new problem. I mean, I think like, again, I don't really know series, like Harry Potter's, it might start with the Temple of Doom or whatever. That, that <laughs> might be Indiana Jones, right? <laughs> the second one might be Harry Potter and the Flying horse or whatever it's a different it's the same people same story world different situation yeah like the harry potter ones i think are pretty good up until like book four or five at kind of reintroducing okay. the situations and everyone so that you can right. sort of dip in at, at that one after like she became like a millionaire and she can assume that most people read the book then she doesn't need to do that but... right she doesn't need to do that right 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 <laughs> Um, okay, we have a question here. Uh, Sophia asking, uh, what first sentences would you avoid in a book that are a little cliche? All, all the um, sort of pitfalls oh. might run into. <laughs> That's a really interesting question. Um, it was a dark and stormy night, of course. You never want to do that. Um, he wouldn't have believed it if he saw it. Um, um, you want, it's not so much that they're a, cliches per se it's more that you don't want to you don't want to have just a description or it's something that's going to lead to a cliche situation like oh i hope i win the i hope i win first prize in the in the running meet or you just want to have something that's going to instantly put a picture in the reader's mind. Um, and a good idea, a good thing to do is go to a bookstore and read a lot of first sentences, read all different kinds, go to the romance section, then go to the literary section, then go to the history section and you'll see they're all different. They're all different. Yeah. We run these um, events here quite regularly. Our first line frenzies where people send in their first, um, oh, that's lines. great. And Rebecca Heyman has like a few hard and fast rules for herself, which, you know, aren't universal, but for her, uh, the big one is like starting with someone waking up. There's a lot oh, of yeah, yeah, yeah. People waking up from, oh, and then you're no just dreams, the first no line. dreams, no dreams, yeah, no dreams. Kiss of death is a dream or a nightmare. Don't start with that. Yeah. Ever, something ever, really hap <laughs> exciting happened at the fireworks factory, but then I realized it was a dream and inconsequential. <laughs> Yeah, people hate that. In movies, too. Absolutely not. <laughs> uh, Talia asks, why do some people say that first sentence should contain so many details? But you're saying that a lack of detail could be infinitely better. Is it just what works for each writer? Instead of... no, Yeah, that's a great question. Instead of details, what it does is it contains a lot of questions, not details. Like he ran. Who is he? Um, what age is he? Is he grown up? Is he a kid? Why is he running? Is it for fun or is it for terror? Is he, you know, in terms of detail, it's details that are going to be supplied further on, but it's going to make us continue to read. What you don't want us to do in a first sentence is say, Billy at 12 years of old, at 12 years of age was a skinny kid with brown hair and blue eyes and he liked to laugh a lot and now he was running down Cortland Street even though he really liked the other streets better I mean you don't want to get bogged down you don't want to get bogged down I think yeah you probably don't want to need 
I think it was a reaction to your talk about like you don't need to describe the world you're in, but I guess no. a few a few keen specifics can sort of help. Like if you don't know who who it is, where they're going, it can help if there's a specific sound right. or a place. So it's not like the amorphous person ran uh, vaguely right. through this white space. Right. Second sentence, we're going to learn more about this kid or this man or whoever he is. Uh, let's see. Any more questions? Oh, yeah, plenty more questions. Uh, let's see. Oh, for endings, can we leave them open-ended, even if it's a standalone? Yes, that's, that's, yes. I love open-ended, I love open-ended, open-ended endings. Yes, you absolutely can. It's like the Margaret Atwood ending. Any questions? Um, I've ended books only where some a woman knew she was pregnant and the possibility it was either one or two guys and you never knew who it was because I just felt like, well, you don't really need, you don't have to know. The important thing was that she was pregnant. And yeah, you can. That can be like really, really interesting thing to do. Uh, let's see. We have uh, Chan Chazel is asking about uh, a sort of an autobiographical novel spanning 50 years. The development is as the life changes. There's a beginning and an ending. Any advice? Yeah, when you're doing something, first of all, if, if it had, think about, does this novel have to be chronological? Do you need to start, you know, when I was born and then I did this, 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 until the end, until, the death. Could you start at the inciting incident where things had been falling apart, you know, where you're such an age and you're going to explain your past. And once you get up to the age you started, then you're going to continue to the end. Or you could start at the end, you know, while you're telling this story, you want people to know. I think the main thing for you would be to ask, what is the question this, uh, this novel is asking? Is it asking what is the life, then you could go chronologically. Or is it asking how do people, excuse me, how do people become <clears throat> whatever it is you became? Then there are certain beats you have to hit. Um, there's, you know, at the beginning and the end, you depend on where you want to start and where you want to end. And you have a whole lot of choices, a whole lot of choices. I would say read a lot of, read a lot of memoirs, you know, read a lot of memoirs and see where people, which memoirs, even though they're supposed to be truthful and many are truthful, you can also see them as, you know, fiction in a way. Just figure out what the question is that you're trying to ask and that will help you determine where you're going to start the book and where you're going to end it because, you know, the question and the answer. Yeah, I think like the good thing about memoirs that a lot of yeah that we sort of distinguish between autobiographies being, you know, a memoir should tell a complete story and it doesn't have to feature everything. Um, you know, the thing I guess you want to avoid with any sort of storytelling is like to start from the cradle and to end at the grave, or to end at the author <laughs> sitting at a desk typing the end on their life story. Right. <laughs> uh, we have some more questions here. Uh, ooh, this one's from AM. What about curse words or the F word? Will that uh, oh, no. turn up an agent? No, they won't. No, it won't. No, it won't. It's fine. If it's appropriate, put it in there. If it's a picture book, <laughs> probably not. Yeah, yeah, probably not. Just use it. I would not for like a children's book, but if it's appropriate, absolutely use it. You know, it's it's if it if it gives a voice to your character, absolutely use it. The one thing you have to be careful about now, at least in America, is um, you know, slur words against other nationalities or other people. Um, if you're writing about a character who is, there are ways to get around it. If you're writing about a character who's like the biggest racist in town and you and we want to hear him speak, you can tell us rather than have to hear him say the words. You can have, you can tell us and say, you know, everybody knew that John was the biggest racist around and nobody mm. wanted to hear his slurs and he was still speaking when everybody walked away. Or, you know, you can't use the slurs as long as we know that he's the biggest racist. It's a, it's a touchy subject right now in America. But yeah. There's like great ways to sort of get the effect without saying it if you don't want to, like, yes, yeah, just to cut to people's reaction to it. 
uh-huh. it's probably more interesting than seeing the word itself. That's right. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we have a question here from Sunny M for science fiction writers. How do you describe things on another world, such as telling time, describing animals? It will take time to describe in English because they're all new to the reader. Describe through action, describe to the character. For example, um, on the um, Xandor, Xander was late for a meeting. He quickly chased his, he tricked, he quickly um, tracked his Bacillula to see where the numbers were. And as usual, it hadn't worked. It was supposed to send out a fluttering sound when it was time. You just make it up as you go along and you do it through actions. You never want to stop and say, on the planet's end, are people told times with birds? Instead, you just show it. You know, this guy goes to the specific bird. He's looking at the way the wing is and saying, okay, he has two wingspans left and then he has to get to that meeting. Um, just always try to do it through the character and through action. Yeah, I think sometimes there is a tendency to, you know, it's the reason why I think a lot of people do prologues, because they won't go like, this is set in a world where there's like three sons, it's really right. important you know there's three sons. Do Whereas like some of the best books <laughs> is written from the perspective of someone who lives in this world, and they're talking to someone else uh, as though they live in the world right. as well. So they don't feel they right. need to explain everything that's weird. They can sort of show it and you just, just go along with it. Or they can say it in dialogue, like one person could say to another, I'm getting too much of a sunburn. Three suns is too much. I'm, I'm going back inside. And then we know there's three suns. And uh, let's see what else we have here. Uh, Caroline, in your opinion, in which cases would tell and not show uh, work? Um, there's a lot of things that you don't really need to show just because <clears throat> it takes up too much time. Like if if you have this direct narrative line, um, let's say it's say it's um, okay. Uh, I'm just thinking of my own book, Days of Wonder. Okay, so she's she's I have scenes where she's getting out of the prison, and her goal is to get out of the prison, get to her mother, get away from the media. Okay, so you're showing all that. You don't need to show what the other people leading the prison are doing or saying or thinking. Instead, you can just say, you know, as she walked out the gates to her mother, she met the eyes of some of the prisoners that she knew when she kept walking on. We don't have to see what they were talking or she stopped to talk and say a few words and then moved on. We don't have to know all that because it's not what we're primarily interested in. We're interested in she's here. She has to get away from the media. She has to get to the car. That's all we care about. Oh, here's an interesting one. Neil asks, I think this is sort of in a very similar way. Uh, Neil asks, what's the best way to show a character's thoughts? Maybe we should broaden that out to what are the sort of different ways you can of showing a character's thoughts? That's really great. Okay, well, um, you can show character's thoughts about what they do. <laughs> Say you have a guy sitting there and he's not showing anything. He's just sitting there like that, staring into space. And... He's working in a dog shelter, say, and he's just sharing into space. And all of a sudden he gets up and he deliberately um, takes the food away from all the dogs. We don't have to hear him thinking, I hate dogs. I hate this job. We know that he hates dogs and he hates his job by his actions. You can do it that way. You can also do it with inner thoughts as long as it's not, as long as it's interesting. Like you take the same guy and he's sitting there saying, you're hungry, dogs. I'm hungry too, but I'm not getting up just because you're supposed to be first. Just because he said something so nasty, we know that he doesn't like the dogs, you know, and he doesn't like his job. You try to give it a tonality so we know what's going on. What you don't want to do is you don't want to put it in quote marks. Oh no, he thought. And <laughs> quote marks again, I don't really like dogs and I don't really like this place and I don't even care if they're hungry because I'm hungry too. So maybe what I'll do is I won't feed them. Yeah, that's what I'll do. I mean, that's like way too much. It's There's, there's just better, more elegant ways of doing it. Uh, let's see. I'm going to have a question that I don't fully understand, but maybe you can uh, pick apart a bit. Can you please talk about questions that change from the beginning to the end? Okay, the questions don't change so much. What happens is the answer can become a new question. You know, like if, you're, if your opening question is, um, 
if you say your opening question is um what what do i have to do to be forgiven for a crime i committed and the person goes through the whole the whole thing um and at the very end the answer is um you know you don't you don't have to do anything some people just won't forgive you then the new question could become okay so now that i know that how do i live my life now i mean question questions can change i mean if your first question was um how do i be how do i be a good parent um and then they go through the whole book and they discover that they don't want to be a parent at all, which is both the answer that leads to a new question. So how do I live my life from now on as a good person without a child when everybody's still pressuring me, have a child, have a child, have a child. How do I do that? You can definitely, the question always starts and it will change and you can have a new question at the end. I hope that answers your question. <laughs> uh, I'm going to end on maybe like a, a couple of curveballs. Uh, let's see. Christine says, can the first line be subtle, like someone breaking a plate, washing up of it hints at the character's future development? I would say the plate breaking is not a very subtle moment. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I don't know if that's subtle. I mean, if it depends. It depends. Like, if is it somebody who's like just turns around and the plate falls from her and crashes on the ground and she just says, Oh, well, and wipes it up. That's not very dramatic. If it's something more like someone takes, someone's washing up and she just like goes like this and the plate smashes, then yeah, that can, that can be a first sentence. What you want to not have is something like, you know, she knit another row. It's kind of, oh, all right. So, so what? I mean, what, what are we going to read on? towards you always you can make it subtle but you always want it so that we're looking ahead at something like sometimes you want to like plant a seed that you can sort of call back to later yes uh, yes how do you sort of how would have you go around sort of you know sowing those seeds without really drawing attention where the reader will go like oh i know what they're doing this is going to come back at the end there's a that's a really great question and it's really hard to do i usually don't do that until like my sixth or seventh or 68th revision um but you do want to do that because you want to plant seeds it's um um early on in my book it's usually objects that will come back it's it's like i have a character who she and her teenage boyfriend both got tattoos and when when one of them goes to prison, they take one of them takes the tattoo off. But then at the end of the book, the tattoo figures again. Or it's like if you've all seen the movie The Sixth Sense, um, which is which is this movie about this little boy that talks to the dead, and he has a psychiatrist that his mother hires to help him. And you don't find out until the very end, spoiler alert, that the psychiatrist is dead and doesn't know it. But as soon as you know that, then all of a sudden everything that came before makes sense. The way that the psychiatrist always had trouble opening doors because he's not real, he's dead, he can't open doors or that when he's talking to his wife, she's not responding. And she's not responding not because she doesn't want to talk to him, but because she knows he's dead and only the dead person doesn't know it. All those things resonate. And as, as many of those as you can do is always a good thing. Yeah, like a, hiding in some, you, it's got to be memorable enough that you remember it. Yes, that you remember it, right, like, right. Some of my favorite ones, like, we'll plant those seeds in jokes. So when people read it, They'll like laugh and they'll sort of make an impact and they sort of believe, oh, this is the reason why it's here. It's a joke. Right. It might not come back later. But then when it does come back, you know, because it had an effect because the joke landed, like right. it'll still be in there. Uh, cool. All right. Uh, if anyone's worried about Sixth Sense spoilers, uh, it's, it's probably on you by this time. If you if you, if you haven't watched it in 25 years, then uh, uh, it's all on you. Uh, all right. I'm going to uh, call... An end to this proceeding. Caroline, I want to thank you so much. Uh, it's always a pleasure to have you on these. I uh, love these. Oh, it's a lot of fun. And, oh, by the way, Caroline is an editor here at Readsy. Um, yes, so I am. It doesn't come out until next April, so I imagine you'll have a couple of months to kill. Uh, what sort of projects yes, are you looking to work on right now? <laughs> um, I'm more than happy to work on fiction, commercial fiction, or literary fiction is fine. I love mysteries. I love memoir. Um, I also do self-help. 
Um, the one thing that I'm not great on is I'm not great on series, as I said. I'm not particularly great with sci-fi. Um, I don't do YA or children's books either. All right. Cool. Uh, we had someone who's a big fan of Wishbone. Uh, oh, yes. I did write children's books. I love that. Was a, my Wishbone years were great. They, they stopped producing Wishbone to put more money into Barney, the purple dinosaur. So... Uh. Oh, well, where's Barney now? <laughs> Nowhere. Nowhere, right. He's a big purple dinosaur. Yeah, it's all gone. Uh, cool. Thank you, Caroline. We're going to have uh, a few more events. Next week, we're doing a write-in. So if you're in the middle of writing something, we'll send, I'll send out an email about it tomorrow. Uh, you can join us, and we're going to actually do some writing sprints online. Uh, Caroline, your next book comes out in April. Uh, what's the title again? <laughs> This is it. It's called Days of Wonder. It's coming out in April. And if you pre-order and show me your pre-order, I will send you an original little drawing I make. <laughs> I will love you forever. Nice. There's a, uh, there's a fun, fun fact in publishing. Pre-orders are really important for bookstores. They help them survive. They're really important for authors so they can keep publishing too. <clears throat> and you can get a free whatever from me. Free cool. drawing. Well, uh, yeah, uh, my email is martin at readsy.com. If you have any thoughts, questions, feedback, send that to me. And if you want to send a picture of your receipt for your uh, pre-order uh, of the book, uh, I'll pass it on, on to Caroline. Okay, you can email me at carolinelevitt, my name, at gmail.com. Um, the only thing I suggest is please put readsy in the subject matter, because otherwise it will just be in the live by my spam. All right, cool, amazing. Everyone, thank you for joining. With, uh, we'll see you again next time. All right. Bye, thank Caroline. You so much. Bye, Martin. Thank you so, so much. And thank you, everybody. See ya.